Sunani ma'am, welcome to the Coffee Celebrity Show. Uh, it's a small video clipping what we usually go through the to tell to the coffee world who are all the people in coffee, how coffee becomes speciality. Uh, without people and without people's efforts, it would not be more possible to make coffee speciality in the community. Uh, so I'm very honored and uh, it's my pleasure. And uh, it's one of my first time that uh, I'll be talking to you. Uh, mm -hmm. Welcome to the show, ma'am. I would request you to give a small introduction of yourself and uh, your uh, involvement in coffee. Yeah, first of all, I should say good morning and uh, thank you very, very much for uh, inviting me to be a part of your campaign. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's an honor for me too, uh, to be, you know, recognized and to be invited to speak at such a campaign. Well, um, you asked me as to, you know, my journey in coffee or how I started it. Well, initially I was, um, I worked at the Coffee Board of India, which is the nodal body for coffee. And um, I started off very young, moved in from uh, another state called Tamil Nadu today and came into Karnataka, found that I was the only woman in an entirely male domain. Even now today, if you look at at people or you look at companies around you, it's, it's mainly, uh, you know, the male uh, gender, but I suppose coffee is all about, um, you know, the male gender being uh, the most predominant. Uh, so when I've been enjoying the coffee board, I was the only woman. So you can imagine being young, not knowing anything on coffee. I didn't even know a little bit about coffee. Coming from a, a post-graduation in food technology, and uh, well, uh, I had a lot of difficulties, but then I always believed that, you know, when you learn the subject, develop the knowledge in it, able to deliver that knowledge, I think people start, you know, start respecting you. It was a long journey, but uh, tumultuous ups and downs. Uh, well, the, the market got liberalized in the year 1995, September to be precise. Uh, I moved out of the board and I thought I would just come, you know, joined my husband who was working in the Middle East at that point of time. I said, hi, I'll have a jolly time. At least I can stay with them, have my daughter with me. But the jolly time became coffee time afterwards. And the farmer said, how can you leave us just now when we are facing difficulties? We know nothing about quality. Rightly so, because when you have a full marketing system, quality takes the back seat, unfortunately. And that's what happened in India. Though the vision initially was to protect the small farmer from vagaries of the international pricing system. And that time it was the quota system. So, well, I decided uh, the plea was a little difficult for me to uh, say no to. So I set up the lab, it's called Coffee Lab. I set it up in Bangalore. I uh, opened its doors uh, in 19, 1st of January, 1996, which I'll never forget. And I still remember one farmer walking in, even today, I sort of help him out, though he's absolutely right on top in terms of branding, quality, et cetera. But he still sort of wants me to evaluate his coffees, visit his farm. He says, you always see something I never see. And it's nice to have an outside perspective. So uh, the lab, uh, of course, I'm very happy with the lab. I work independently, unlike in the coffee board, when I had so many rains to you know, we, I mean, I had enough brains to be pulled back, but here, uh, I'm a free person, I'm sure you, you'll appreciate that because you run your own enterprise. You know, of course it has its worries, uh, but then life has its worries, I guess, even otherwise. So I enjoy coffee and I find that's a beautiful, beautiful bean to handle. The touching, the feeling, the, uh, the uh, color, the smell, the, the taste, I think, uh, it's such a tiny bean, but it really, really humbles you. And that's what I love about the bean. You can never say you know it all. So today, I still continue with my uh, job. I've been 52 years in coffee. I just cannot even believe that. But I wow. still feel very young with a coffee bean. I think that's what, again, the coffee does to you. It makes you feel very young. I still feel I'm sweet 16. And I think my daughter keeps reminding me, you know, my, you know what your age is? What are you running like this? Um, so I said, that's what coffee does to you. So I think it's a very beautiful profession to be in. And you can never say you know it all. The knowledge, 
I mean, it's an ever learning process. And that's what I think keeps me really excited about coffee. I mean, like we all, when we come across a coffee community in any part of the world, they all first name comes out of India when we say is, uh, do you know Sonali Menon? <laughs> so you have been iconic coffee person of India, which uh, I always have so proud or I'm so happy that uh, I know you in person. Uh, so that's what makes us happy. And uh, thank you for being in coffee and uh, promoting Indian coffee. Thank you, ma'am. What are the wider aspects Coffee Lab uh, today is taking or how is it helping a different aspects of coffee, whether it's a farmer, whether it's a uh, trader and what all the aspect Coffee Lab covers, ma'am? Yes, uh, well, we started, as I said, on the first of January 1996. And uh, the, I mean, the first lab of its kind to be set up in the private sector. And wow. so, you know, it was a quite a, what a daunting task for me because I was setting down parameters. I was setting down the work ethics. I was sort of, it was like a discovery for me as to what can I do for coffee? So it was literally, uh, you know, getting into a maze uh, not knowing whether I was entering the right door. Uh, but still, I said, let me take that challenge. Well, the first task, of course, I already know was the fact that the farmers were not really conversant with quality. What are the parameters that are very important in terms of you know, quality perception of a coffee bean? What is it that the buyer wants to you know, taste when he buys his coffee? What are the steps that the farmer needs to take from the time he harvests his cherry till the time it comes into the cup? It's a long journey. The farmer does, didn't realize that, that the first important step was how I harvest my cherries. He said, what's so great about it? I just go there, send my workers, they pluck all the cherries. I said, yeah, you use the right word, pluck all the cherries. That's where the quality gets negated. So I said, you can't pick all the cherries because you want to get quantity and not quality. So you started off with that work, working with a farmer. That was the first point, because as I said, when I opened the doors, it was the farmer who walked in with his beans, hugged to his chest, having a nice aftershave lotion on. And he gave me the coffee beans. I said, ha, ah, this must be David off. So he was so shocked. <laughs> He said, no, I brought coffee beans. I said, no, I know you brought coffee beans, but you also brought David off along the way. And he said, what? How can you smell it? You haven't come close to me. I said, no, I don't need to come to clo close to you. I just smell your beans. I said, that's the first step you have to learn. Coffee absorbs smells very easily, whether it's green coffee or roasted coffee. And your quality is gone now. When I taste, I'll only get David off in my cup. And no buyer wants Davidoff. He can go to the perfumery store and buy Davidoff, the authentic Davidoff, not a coffee bean Davidoff. So you see, it started off with that, you know, trying to teach them what are the aspects of quality? What are the factors that brings about deterioration in quality? What are the factors that enhance the quality? What is it in the farm that he can improve upon in terms of processing right from the step of harvesting till the time he sort of, you know, delivers green coffee beans to the buyer. He said, what about cupping? I don't think, it's, I think it's all sort of some storytelling. Uh, I said, I know, you probably think I'm telling you stories. Well, you learn to know how to build that story. You'll be using my stories to build your story, to brand it. Even today, he remembers those lines because he's now this farmer, brands his coffee, very well known in the coffee world. But I had to explain to him that branding is not just storytelling. You need to have the core. You need to have the quality attributes. You need to explain to the buyer because he doesn't know anything about Indian coffee. I mean, those days, Indian coffee was called a filler coffee. I mean, I still remember going to the SEA shows, setting up my booth. They would come, the, you know, the people who are passing by, the buyers, uh, the well-known coffee companies passing by. Ah, Indian coffee. It can't be, there must be an error, it must be Indian tea. And I used to think to myself, oh my God, I'm only known for tea. Well, I hope one day comes when they come to me and say, 
can I buy coffee from India? And I could turn down and say, I'm sorry, we're all sold out. You should have come much earlier. I would have given you the best of the beans. Well, it's been a long journey. So I Coffee Lab handles the evaluation of coffee for the farmer, works with the farmer, builds his coffee, and helps him to brand it, helps him to sell his coffee. But I'm not a marketer, and I make that very clear. If you as a buyer comes to me and says, you know, Mrs. Menon, I need this particular profile. Can we put you, can you put me in, in contact with the farmer? I put him in contact with the farmer whom I think would meet his requirements, but I don't assure that to the, to the farmer. I'm not a marketing person and I'd like to be independent in terms of judging the quality of the coffee. Otherwise I'm going to get biased because I'm making money on being a broker, broker between the seller and the buyer. I like to maintain my independence and just be a quality person. Well, being just a quality person also has its drawbacks because, you know, I have to look after a whole group of people in the lab. But then once you establish yourself, people come to you automatically and say, can I have my quality evaluated? So that's one aspect of my work. The second aspect is to certify coffees. I certify coffees for various buyers from around the world. I mean, they, they trust my evaluation. They uh, you know, leave it to me to evaluate the coffees. I don't go and select the coffees for them. They have their own sellers. The sellers have to send the coffees to me. I evaluate it, send the reports and say, well, this is of this quality. And then the price negotiation takes place between the buyer and the seller. I'm just the quality evaluator. Evaluator, but the onus is so huge on you. I mean, I really have. I still remember when I first started the journey with one particular very well-known roaster. Every time I would say, "This is beautiful coffee," he'd say, "This is rubbish," and I would feel so despondent. I mean, it took me a couple of years to understand what he wanted and what I thought was quality was really not quality for him. So you see, it's a long journey. You have to understand each buyer. What is it that he looks for? I mean, there may some who may want a very viney fermented, you know, I can't say bad quality ferment, but something which is very viney. But there are others who say it's an off note. So the, the farmer has to understand that. He says, no, no, I sold it to so-and-so. He paid me such a high price. And you are saying this is not a high quality. This is an off note co coffee. Then I have to explain to him. So certification is a very important aspect. The third important aspect that I carry out is training. I do a lot of teaching. I never thought I could be a teacher. Never, ever thought. I never dreamt in my life. I never thought when I was growing up that I would be a teacher. But I still remember a farmer coming to me when I set up a lab and said, you know, I'm bringing my entire office staff here. You're going to teach them coffee. I said, I'm not a trainer. I'm not a teacher. I've never done. He said, I challenge you. And I love challenges. If someone throws a challenge at me, I say, I'll do it. He knew that, I think, because he threw the challenge. He said, you can do it at the end of the month. I'll give you 15 days time. You work it out. So I said, okay, I'll work it out. And I sat there and killed myself for the next one week saying, what do I teach them? How do I teach them? But that was the beginning of a beautiful journey for me, a journey which I'm so happy that I have been able to deliver. And I think it's so nice to see a young mind, you know, looking at you, absorbing it, coming back to you at the end of the session and say, I'm coming back again, Mrs. Manon. I want to learn more for you. And this is what happened, in fact, this morning. There's a young lady from Mumbai, young person, young entrepreneur. Can you, uh, you know, check our machines for, for us? I said, yes, I would be happy. So I would tell them, yeah, this works for us. If you adjust this, this could work for us. And, and in fact, some of them are making it here in India. So we help them and guide them along the way, depending on how they want to use the machine. Another very important aspect is blending. We do a lot of blends. I never thought again, blending could become one of my strengths, but we help the cafes. We help overseas and, uh, you know, roasters to, you know, blending Indian coffee. In fact, I'm just onto a project now where I'll be blending you know, Indian coffee beans to match an overseas blend, which has components from various parts of the world. 
a beautiful challenge again thrown at my face. I said, okay, I will do it. So we do the blending work. And again, that's a part of it. So this perhaps is in a nutshell of what we do from the time the coffee cherries get picked to the time it comes into your cup. It's a long, a whole beautiful journey. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, uh, I think as you mentioned in between, uh, when people say all about tea when it comes for India and you have been always proposing coffee or you've been in coffee. So how challenging was it that to get a recognition for Indian coffee versus Indian tea? Oh, it was a, a massive task. Massive means massive, uh, especially because we grow both Robustas and Arabicas. Robusta, aha, it's a dirt coffee. You talk about Robusta, please, I don't touch Robusta. But if you go behind the wings and see, he's quietly using Robusta coffee to keep his price down. So, you know, it's it's wonderful when you unearth such things and then slowly, very gently, you tell them, oh, but I think you're using a little Robusta, right? But maybe high quality Robusta, very gently. And then he looks at you and says, how do you know I use Robusta? Well, the taste profile does tell me, it could be a little bit of Robusta. He said, oh God, you've got a sharp nose and a longer, you know, a long nose. That's why he's a long tongue and a sharp, uh, you know, a sharp, uh, tongue and a long nose. I said, yeah, and I've also got piercing eyes. So, you know, so that's how it goes. But when I started with coffee, I realized that, yes, there was a reason why people did not know Indian coffee. First of all, they started comparing co Indian coffee with, say, a Guatemalan coffee or a Costa Rican coffee or a Kenyan coffee. It doesn't match. It certainly doesn't match. Kenya is so juicy. It's got so many, you know, as they say, black cut and blackberry notes. And I sometimes wonder, I wish I could eat blackberries to understand the blackberry notes. I don't get it in India. So sometimes when I travel, I go rushing to the market to eat blackberries to understand it. Uh, I mean, I can't compare it to Costa Rica. I mean, it's so, so bright. It's so sweet and bright. Sometimes it tends to be a little sour. Then it's beautiful coffee. I can't compare it to Ethiopia, which for me is the world's best coffee. Where can I get the lemon grass or the lemon twist as they put it, you know, jasmine notes in my coffee? I can probably do some coffee in a better processing by putting the coffee beans along with jasmine flowers and getting it, you know, like I said, the David off, I can have some jasmine in my coffee beans. So it was a daunting task, but once the quality of Indian coffee started, you know, slowly farmers, they, the, the pooling system got closed and, you know, and the free marketing got open. The farmer realized that if he wants to sell, he will have to look at quality. So quality journey began. And today I can hold my head, head high up and say, my quality is really good. It's still a long journey to take because I want to reach a level when, you know, they pay me the price that, I would like to get as I get from an Ethiopian coffee. That is my ambition. And I hope, I'm sure there are some farmers who can do it because they're already on the road to it. A daunting task when compared to tea, but today I can say coffee competes very well, Indian coffee with Indian tea in terms of its uh, quality and in terms of, to an extent, in terms of it, of it being known in the world market. Yeah, sure. And we are just hoping that uh, we get more and more recognition and uh, there's a big, big involvement of yours, uh, whatever we are going through it. We are so excited to see that uh, Indian coffee is getting higher and higher. So today, what we have heard in past with Indian coffee, and definitely we are on the better position. And uh, you have seen or you have teach people how to get better. And in last five to 10 years, we have seen a big shift in terms of uh, what it used to be on the negative or uh, unacceptable notes in terms of uh, coffee characters has become a trend or it's a kind of requirement from the new era of coffee or new processes. How do you see what is the kind of shift or what is the type of uh, customer behavior in terms of requirement of uh, new trending coffees, new processed coffees? 
Uh, yes, uh, in fact, uh, you know, I love to use the word bio-innovative uh, kind of processing techniques. I use the word bio because of the fact that we don't add chemicals. We are oh. developing the yeast and the bacteria that are already there, changing their metabolic pathways. And I do that through an anaerobic fermentation. I do that through carbonic maceration. I do that through a double fermentation, which was never there. I mean, when I was growing up in coffee, I only knew the traditional method of processing. What was that? Washed coffee, unwashed coffee. You know, washed coffee was called parchment and unwashed was called natural. And then I slowly started looking around and I said, oh my God, what's happening out here? And I'm getting such lovely notes, which I never saw you know, when I was traveling overseas, uh, especially when I used to go to Ethiopia, I used to get some different notes from the same farm. I said, hey, what are you doing? They said, no, no, nothing. It's just the Ethiopian bean. I said, ah, oh, okay. And you know, I, I really didn't understand very much. I went to Costa Rica and they gave me something which was so sweet. I said, what are you doing? But they said, they were a little bit forthcoming and a little bit open. And they said, that's a honey coffee. I said, oh, how do you make honey coffee? And then they told me, you know, you don't remove the mucilage, but it's not as simple as it sounds. You have to be very careful when you're trying the coffee. And then came the era of black honey, red honey, yellow honey. And now I'm wondering whether purple honey would come and who knows. So you see, there has been a slow movement towards different innovative processing. And today, I think we have such a large, you know, what shall I say, processing methodologies that every day I'm learning something. Now we have some kochi fermentation. I said, oh my God, what's it? Tomorrow I probably have sake fermentation you know, putting in some sake into my coffee and probably I'll go off on a high with it. So it, it, it's really, very really exciting. I mean, to see, uh, I mean, I would agree with you when you say some of the taste notes are quite different. I mean, I can't associate them with coffee. In fact, uh, one particular participant who was very new to coffee, he said, why do I have to taste this? drink this particular coffee? I can drink Tropicana fruit juice. I get all these fruit juices there. I don't have to pay this high price that all of you are demanding. So, you know, I had to sit down with him and said, hey, you know, it, Tropicana is not, a, a, it's a juice which has so many preservatives in it, blah, blah. You know, I had to sort of water it down saying, you know, it's, it's actually quite Tropicana, it's quite tasty. But, you know, I had to say coffee is far more, you know, it has got a lot of antioxidants which Tropicana cannot give you. So I went off into the health journey and, he said, oh, I see, oh, I see, and he went back. The next time I meet, meet him, he says, you know, man, when I was eating my sambar, I was getting so many flavor notes that you were describing. We're talking about this spice and that spice. I saw it in my sambar. I said, oh, at last you saw your sambar really critically when you were eating. He said, no, that's the pain in my house because now I'm pointing out to my wife, this is like this, this is like that. And she says, oh my God, why did you go to Mrs. Mellon's class? So you see, I mean, you know, it's, it's things like that, which sometimes makes me feel very happy and makes me sit up and say, oh, coffee is such a beautiful journey. Ma'am, always uh, you've been uh, trying to promote the very first person gets into the coffee is coffee farmer. So how important is marketing the coffee farmer, the whole coffee business? I think the marketing is a very important aspect. You know, I can grow the best of coffee beans. I can have the best of varieties, best of processing methodologies, best of taste uh, profiles. But if I don't have a buyer to appreciate and pay me the price that I richly deserve, I mean, there's just no point. So I really need to make, that is one of the biggest errors that we made in India. Our marketing efforts were very poor. We sat in our own homes, in our own farms, and said, my coffee is the best. Who knew your coffee was the best? He said, no, the buyer will come to my doorstep and take it. I said, no buyer is going to come to you and take your coffee. He doesn't even know you exist. He doesn't know that you have these varietals. He doesn't know that you're processing it differently. He doesn't know anything about your coffee. And so it started in a very small way, participating in events participating in fairs. That's where I've seen you a couple of times in some of these fairs. So they started slowly moving. You know, they didn't want to spend the money. 
they felt that your coffee is so good that they'll come, people will come and take it like selling your basmati rice. Yes, today is well known for basmati rice. I can sit back and say, take it or leave it. But I haven't reached that stage in my coffee. So the farmers started participating. We started having presentations, you know, taste presentations. In fact, I used to help the coffee board in making the presentations. I used to help the Specialty Coffee Association of India and making the farmer speak about his coffee. And I would introduce the farmer saying, this is so-and-so. He would talk about his coffee and then we will taste the coffee. So we would taste, I would take the, the buyer through the entire taste uh, nuances and tell him this is what is unique about the coffee. So, you know, marketing is something which today I think the farmer understands it. But unfortunately, I don't have the very many aids that I, in other countries, I feel so jealous when I go to Africa. You know, they have so many people giving in aid. You have USAID, you have Chemonics, you have ActiVoca, you have EFAD, you have so many people giving money to them. But I suppose they richly deserve it. I'm not, I'm not saying don't give them. I'm saying give them more. But can I have some help? Can I have some help from various people? And of course, the government is trying to do their best, but they have their own reservations. They have so many other products or commodities which they have to handle first. I mean, coffee may be quite minuscule for India because we are just maybe the, you know, the percentage we produce is 4% of the world production. So we are very small. But, um, and of course, the small farmers are there. But we need that support for marketing. Today, I think the board is doing a great deal for marketing, participating, asking the embassies of India and different countries to hold events. And even during the lockdown, it's very interesting to see, even during the lockdown, they had virtual meets. I still remember attending one virtual meet and it was a whole lot of buyers were invited in that particular country, it was actually China. And there were a whole lot of uh, buyers from China asking questions. The farmers were answering the questions. And there was an exchange, I think, of ideas, knowledge, which I think opened some doors for our farmers. So I think marketing, I feel, is a very, very crucial aspect. And if we don't succeed in marketing, we can never sell our product. Um, uh, the you had uh, pointed out uh, coffee as expensive or expensive coffee. Expressive, expressive, I think. Uh, sorry, ex sorry, expressive coffee. So if you can just tell a few words on that, please. Yeah. When I say expressive coffee, you know, coffee is a living being. It's a respiring being, you know, it can emote, it has feelings just like you and me, except that we need to understand that. We need to understand that that expression of fading of the bean, why it fades. It's like you and me entering a room with closed windows, closed doors. We cannot breathe. What happens to us? We start sweating, right? It's just like that. When you put this living bean in a closed room and the relative humidity is very high, the temperature is very high, what happens? It sort of breathes very heavily. It respires. And in the process, chemical changes take place and the beans first pale, become pale, they become fairer, then they become bleached. So that is one aspect when you talk of expressive, you know, it expresses itself in so many ways, but you have not understood it. Like, you know, many people don't understand your emotions, your feelings, or, you know, when you want to express yourself, maybe you express the wrong things, not realizing that you didn't express yourself correctly but the other person has not understood you. Similarly, the bean is trying to tell you something about itself. You've got to give it the time. You've got to understand it. You've got to realize it's something which is as living as you until, of course, it gets roasted. But another aspect of being expressive is it can express all its latent inherent flavor notes provided you know how to bring out those flavor notes into the cup. So there is an expression of, you know, its innermost quality and flavor, provided you know how to bring them out. It's there within you, just like, you know, bringing out your emotions. There are some people who can bring out an emotion 
or say happiness. You just look at them and you feel happy. There are some who bring in an expression of anger because you always associate that person with something which perhaps you did not appreciate. But that's something, of course, you need to avoid, but it does happen. So similarly, the coffee bean, it can express itself if you process the coffee really well, handle the coffee very, cherries very carefully, make sure you harvest ripe red cherries. I always tell my farmer, taste the cherry, see if it is sweet, the color is not an indication, just like you and me, understand you and me, and then pass judgment. Don't just simply look at a person and say, oh, it's very well dressed, so it must be a great person. Understand the person, just like the coffee cherry. Just not the color, taste it. I always tell my farmer, then you say, oh, but then my farm, my, all my workers will eat up the cherries. So how much can we eat? They probably will eat three cherries, four cherries. You can't spare those four cherries to get a high quality and to get that price, which is 10 times that four cherries. And then they laugh at me and say, yeah, you have a point. I said, you know, they are, it, it, the cherry is expressing itself not only in terms of color, but also in taste. So that's when I say expression, expressive. Uh, the bean can express itself, provided you bring those notes out, provided you understand the bean, and provided you know how to use it. I mean, I can give you about the, the best of beans, but if you roast it in a very, you know, in not in a very correct manner to highlight those notes, all the trouble that I've taken expressing myself is lost. Or if I give it to my brewer and he uses the wrong equipment, uses the wrong grind size, uses the wrong ratio of powder to water, I get a, such a terrible coffee that I say, oh, these beans are terrible. It's not the beans, it's you who brewed the coffee. Again, you're expressing negative taste profile. That's how I use the word expressive. Yeah, I would like it's every, every stage you have briefed so well of the expression. Thank you so much. Uh, one last thing, ma'am, uh, regarding the woman in coffee and how all the woman aspects are involved in coffee, right from growing to processing and brewing. And you have been another uh, great initiative from your side is to promote uh, women in coffee. So how are we placed today in India in women in coffee and around the world? I think when, as I mentioned to you earlier, when I started, I was the only woman and it was very daunting because, you know, I knew nothing on coffee and here was, there were men all around me. I still remember when I walked into a conference and they said, can I have a cup of coffee? Not realizing that I was the speaker for the day. So I said, yes, we will certainly serve you coffee, sir, but just give me a few moments. I'll just finish what I'm doing and I'll get you your coffee. And I walked straight to the rostrum and you see in the face, the look on their face after I came, you know, finished my presentation. They came up to me and apologized. I said, no, don't apologize. I just want to put a message across to you that, you know, women can not only serve coffee, but can also explain to you coffee and brew the coffee and make you understand that there are so many nuances in coffee which you may not even be aware of. So that is something which has you know, always remained in my mind, that people have a set opinion of a woman, especially in coffee. I mean, it's there in every, every field I know, but in coffee, I'm more familiar with it because I've gone through it. But today, I'm so happy to tell you about them that it's wonderful to see so many young women in India in different facets of the coffee value chain. Take a roast drink. I mean, I'm so happy to see this young girl saying, you know, I'm a roaster. And she roasts it really well. She understands the coffee bean. And she can even compete with a male roaster. Of course, I didn't ask her to compete with a male roaster because then again becomes, you know, saying, oh, you know, I won over the so-and-so. I don't want that sort of, you know, feeling to, uh, you know, to pop into a woman. I would like her to appreciate and treat everyone with respect. So I see today a woman as a roaster. I see a woman as a farmer. I mean, before, one of the nicest things in India, which unfortunately I did not see in Africa, was that, you know, when our culture is, when I, you know, inherit a farm from my parents, and when I get married, I, I'm not saying that my husband grabs it from me, 
but I give it to my husband and say, you run it and I will be along with you. So there's an equal partnership here, unlike perhaps in Africa, which unfortunately, they're trying to see how best they can alleviate it. But today in India, the culture generally is that when I own something, my husband will run it and I will help him out and he treats me as an equal. That's beautiful. But today there are, maybe due to various reasons, it could be due to unforeseen circumstances, that women have to run the farm on their own and they're running it extremely well. I know of certain farmers who branded their coffee, selling their coffee, talking about their coffee. So that is another very interesting aspect. Come to the cafe chain. Oh my God, it's booming in India. You have, you know, you saw it in NBC when you came to India. But there were so many baristi who come. There were lots of women and I was so happy to see that, you know, uh, some of the women did win. Though I was hoping that she would be the number one winner. But unfortunately, she didn't do all that well. But a young girl, I mean, who hasn't got much experience, did extremely well. So you have cafes, you have them as baristas, you have them as owners of cafes. In fact, I interacted a few weeks back with a woman entrepreneur who set up a cafe and she's doing very well. She started off in a small way as a takeaway and today she owns a cafe. So I think in every sphere today in India, it's so heartwarming to see women, young women, playing such an important role, wanting to learn, wanting to absorb, wanting to serve the best of coffee cups to a consumer and wanting to explain about coffee. And that's absolutely a, such a trend in India. And I think a game changer for our very humble Indian coffee bean. Nice, ma'am. Thank you so much. And uh, in last uh, few words uh, to close this session uh, about uh, Indian specialty coffee and uh, what you would like to see in just a short cup. Uh, yes, you know, but Gautam, I'm always very scared of the word specialty, to be very honest with you. Huh. I want the word specialty to come from you as a user of coffee, as a buyer of coffee. If you were to tell me it's specialty, I'm honored. I realize it is specialty. But when I look at coffee, getting a score of 80 or 82 or 84, I always tell my farmer, it's a very special coffee. It's very unique. It's very distinctive. Because sometimes when I say specialty, it is used in an incorrect, you know, usage. Every coffee becomes specialty. Oh, I grow specialty coffee on my farm. It's not every coffee which is specialty. There are certain coffees which definitely earn 84, if not 86. But it's not all your coffees of your farm. And that's where I'm a little diffident to use the word specialty. But if you were to ask me, where does India stand in the specialty scene? I think we are quite a way up on the ladder. There are some such unique robustas. I, I always want to emphasize robustas as my parting shot because I think robustas could be a future. I mean, when climate change is really hitting us, I think you heard of Bangalore being doused with water. They're using, uh, you know, boats, coracles to, you know, coracles or coracles to take us, you know, out of our own homes into safety. Imagine having our roads filled with water. I think with climate change, they expect in 2050 to Arabica production to go down, unless of course something happens in between, research is on, lots of varieties are being looked at. But I think Robusta will occupy a very important position. So I would say when you talk about specialty, of course, I, they refuse to accept my terminology of specialty robusta when we were drawing up the standards for robusta coffee in Kampala, Uganda, many years ago. Finally, they accepted the fine robusta. So I had to say, okay, fine robusta, beautiful word, different from, from specialty at Africa. So I think, yes, uh, that today we are, have climbed the ladder. There are a lot more rungs to be climbed up, but we are getting there. And I think... Very soon, I probably can change my terminology from special to specialty. Uh, of course, once all the buyers tell me, oh, Mrs. Manny, you're producing excellent specialty coffees in India. I haven't reached that stage, but I'm sure we'll get there very soon. Thanks very, very much, Gautam. It's been a pleasure talking to you. 
as I told you, sometimes I get carried away by coffee. It's not every day, but uh, I hope I didn't sort of prolong it too long. Uh, but uh, I hope I was able to, you know, to answer all your questions, uh, uh, you know, uh, to the way that you would like me to explain or, uh, or uh, you know, answer. No, it was absolute pressure. And uh, as I said in the starting, I was a bit nervous uh, <laughs> because these are the questions. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thanks for the time and uh, thanks for all the information passed on. Thank you very much. Thanks again to Andy. Thanks to Brat. Thanks, of course, to Gautam. And I hope thank that I can have the pleasure of having seen, seeing all of you in, in my lab very soon uh, when we can have a great cup of Indian specialty coffee. Sure. Thanks again. Thank you.